When Sasha and Cord had been in the house for three weeks, Sasha invited her in-laws to dinner. I'll make mushroom tarts and a goat cheese salad, she said in the email. She spent all morning rolling pie dough and even walked to the fancy market on Montague for pomegranate seeds to sprinkle over baby lettuces. She vacuumed the dining room, dusted the bookshelves, and put a sancerre in the fridge. When her in-laws arrived, they had three L.L. Bean canvas bags in tow. Oh, you didn't have to bring anything, Sasha exclaimed, dismayed. Sasha, her mother-in-law trilled, opening the closet to hang her Chanel boucle jacket. We can't wait to hear all about your honeymoon. She carried the bags into the kitchen and proceeded to pull out a bottle of white burgundy, two flower arrangements in low vases, a tablecloth with fleur-de-lis on it, and three scalloped Williams-Sonoma baking dishes with lids. She lined them up on the counter and, like a woman at home in her kitchen of 40 years, opened up the cabinet to take down a glass for her wine. I've made mushroom tarts, Sasha tried, suddenly feeling like the lady at the Costco free sample table trying to sell warm cubes of processed cheese. Oh, I saw in your email, darling. I gathered that meant it was a French-themed dinner. You just let me know when you're ten minutes away, and I'll pop my cocoa van in the oven. I also have endive provençale, and I brought plenty, so we might not need your salad. The candlesticks are in the drawer there. Now let's go take a look at your tabletop arrangement, and I'll see what else we need. Out of solidarity, Cord ate the tart and the salad, but when Sasha caught him looking longingly at the endive, she gave him a thin smile that said, You can eat the damned vegetables, but you might have to sleep on the couch. The agreement was new for all of them, and Sasha understood it was going to take some getting used to. Cord's parents, Chip and Tilda, had been complaining for years that their house was too big for the two of them, that it was too far from their garage, that they were tired of doing their own shoveling and hauling their own recycling out to the curb. They were investors in an apartment building two blocks away, the former Brooklyn Heights movie theater that was now five luxury condos, and they had decided to take the maisonette for themselves moving in over the course of one week, using only their old Lexus and their housekeeper's husband, whom they paid 300 bucks. That seemed like a quick divestment from a house they'd inhabited for four decades. But aside from their clothing, Sasha couldn't really figure out what they had brought to the new place. They had even left their four-poster king-size bed in their bedroom, and Sasha felt more than a little weird sleeping there. The Stocktons decided to let Sasha and Cord move into their vacant house and live there as long as they would like. Then, when they sold the place one day, they would split the money between Cord and his two sisters. There were some other pieces of the agreement designed to evade unnecessary inheritance taxes, but Sasha looked the other way for that bit of paperwork. The Stocktons may have let her marry their son, but she understood on a bone-deep level that they would rather let her walk in on them in the middle of an aerobic threesome with Tilda's bridge partner than have her studying their tax returns. After dinner, Sasha and Cord cleared the table while his parents headed into the parlor for an after-dinner drink. There was a bar cart in the corner of the room with old bottles of cognac that they liked to pour into tiny gold-rimmed glasses. The glasses, like everything else in the house, were ancient and came with a history. The parlor had long blue velvet drapes, a piano, and an itchy ball and clawfoot sofa that had once belonged in the governor's mansion. Sasha made the mistake of sitting on it once and got such a bad rash on the backs of her legs that she had to use calamine lotion before bed. There was a chandelier in the foyer, a grandfather clock in the dining room that chimed so loudly Sasha screamed a little the first time she heard it, and an enormous painting of a ship on a menacingly dark ocean in the study. The whole place had a vaguely nautical vibe, which was funny since they were in Brooklyn, not Gloucester or Nantucket, and though Chip and Tilda had certainly spent summers sailing, they mostly chartered boats with crew. The glassware had ship's wheels etched in them, the placemats had oil paintings of sailboats, the bathroom had a framed seafaring chart, and even their beach towels had diagrams for tying various knots. Sometimes Sasha found herself wandering the house in the evenings, running her hand along the ancient frames and candlesticks, whispering, batten down the hatches and swab the deck, and making herself laugh. 